to the Hallie Kesser Jane Show. Let's talk. And I am Hallie Kesser Jane. Welcome to my listeners in the United States and around the world. Tune in to the Hallie Kesser Jane Show at HallieKesserJane.com. Today on the show, a look at the quirks of American presidents. What? Presidents have quirks? and a conversation about the Hollywood blacklist and the making of the classic Western film, High Noon. My guest, the author of Secret Lives of the U.S. Presidents, Strange Stories and Shocking Trivia, from Inside the White House, Cormac O'Brien, and Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Glenn Frankel, author of a fantastic book, High Noon, The Hollywood Blacklist and the Making of an American Classic. Let's get to it. We begin with Cormac O'Brien. The great Clarence Darrow once said, When I was a boy, I was told that anyone could be president. I'm beginning to believe it. Author Cormac McCarthy sets out to prove just that point. In his book, Secret Lives of the U.S. Presidents, Strange Stories and Shocking Trivia from Inside the White House, a fun, informative, quirky compendium of historical trivia of our American presidents, murder, adultery, gambling, UFOs. The Secret Lives of the U.S. Presidents features outrageous and uncensored profiles of the men who have occupied the Oval Office in one of the hardest jobs in the world. From the father of our country, George Washington, to President Donald Trump, Cormac O'Brien reveals that at the end of the day, our presidents are just like us. Neurotic, impulsive, flawed, brilliant, controversial, and very, very human. Let's talk. So listen to me. I like what you remind us of in the beginning of the book, what it says in the Constitution. Let me read this. (laughs) This from Secret Lives of the U.S. Presidents in our American Constitution. No person except a natural born citizen shall be eligible to the office of the president. Neither shall any person be eligible to that office who shall not have attained to the age of 35 years and been 14 years a resident within the United States. But Cormac, not much there about sanity. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, no, there isn't, is there? Uh, and um, there, in fact, there isn't much there about almost anything. So uh, it, it leaves it leaves it pretty wide open, and that's one of the extraordinary things about our democracy. You know, we, some some places have a separate head of state, like a queen or a monarch, and then a separate head of government, like our prime minister. But in our president, you have both jobs, and so we put a lot uh, a lot at stake in this person who was one amongst us. You know, it is absolutely extraordinary when you think about that, and particularly if, if you bring it up to current times, because some things have been a little bit different for the last uh, four or five election cycles. What exactly did you set out as your task when you began to prove how sane our presidents are, or how nuts they are, or how peculiar they are, or what? It was really uh, intended to be um, a, a book about the white, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a history of the presidency, if you will, that's that's unusual and quirky and dishy. And so to get people talking again about American history in a way that they don't always, because all of these figures, or at least the vast majority of them, are familiar even to people who aren't necessarily history buffs. But they don't, they don't know that it's, it's, it's about more than just negotiating treaties and working with Congress and appointing judges. Uh, these are people, and history, I think, is all the more interesting if you know that and you learn about it. Uh, and so you have the, the, you know, the great panoply of history behind them, but in the foreground is the fact that, you know, they, they have quirks and foibles and failings, just like, just like everyone. Uh, what fascinates me about it is that, and maybe it's because of we're all, you and I are a product of our times, but so we don't know how people actually got their news, if you will, other than locally lo- small papers. They didn't have this great vast television network thing that we have an sure. internet and that kind of thing, which would have to change it. But, you know, caricature, is that a word that you, you, you want, could get into with all of this? Or do we see them as truly dimensional or are they become caricatures to us? That's a, a good question. I think I think some of them do become caricatures. Um, you know, I think most with President's Day coming up, the, the two biggest, of course, Washington and Lincoln, separated by you know generations, but um, revered in a in a in a special way, and each of them is revered to the point. Even and and Washington in his day was a was a demigod. He was he was a legend in his own time to a degree that Lincoln wasn't. Although uh, Lincoln's death, I think, transformed him into something like that. Um, but the, and, and it, so today there are caricatures. You know, the, the Washington is this, uh, this towering um, savior of the revolutionary moment. 
unsmiling, uh, you know, powdered uh, wig. Uh, he was so much more than that. He was a fascinating guy, and um, a lot of his trials shaped what kind of president he became. And Lincoln is, is, is the ultimate example because he had a great sense of humor, which you don't see in the Lincoln Memorial, which is one of my favorite memorials in Washington. Probably my favorite because it's, it's just majestic and it strikes the right note and it brings a tear to your, to your eye, makes you understand the man and the import um, of, his, of his presidency. But there he is on that throne looking down at you, a dour, uh, a serious, somber even. And he, he, was, uh, he, was, um, he was anything but, even though he suffered from melancholy. He told a lot of ridiculous frontier stories. He was always the first to laugh at them. Um, he, he believed in silliness. He uh, was a, a, a doting father who let his kids run you know, rampant around the White House, often to uh, his wife's chagrin. And, and stuff like that, which, you know, you don't see in the caricature. I want to get back more to Washington. One of my very good friends is actually one of his uh, great, great, great somebody or others kind of thing. Uh, and, and I'm always fascinated by this guy. And you, you actually dug up some stuff uh, that, that's a little bit different on him. How tough was that to, to dig up? I mean, what kind of real, are there great records on him or not? Oh, well, sure. And historians uh, have, been, have been doing this uh, since the beginning. Uh, and there are excellent historians who, you know, the presidents being more or less the closest thing we have to a monarchy uh, are, are, have been under scrutiny by um, historians, uh, sin, you, know, since time, you know, since the beginning of the country. So it's out there. It's just lost in the noise of the more official histories that we're all taught in school and that we feel is more pertinent to understanding our past. But um, it, it's so it's hard to dig up, but probably not as hard as some people would think. So so let's talk about what I was always told he had wooden teeth. No, he doesn't. Didn't. <laughs> no, no, he didn't. Uh, I don't know if anybody did back then. It's um, I don't know why his teeth were so bad. Uh, it, you know, from uh, from a relatively young age, he, he was forced to wear dentures, but they were animal bone. Uh, the, the, the pair that uh, he, he wore probably as president uh, were, were pr- probably made of hippopotamus bone. Now, what's interesting about that is that, of course, it was durable. It could, it, could, it could take the kind of work teeth were expected to do, but it was porous. It was a porous material. So um, it's one of the reasons he, he was so unsmiling, despite the fact that he wanted to cultivate a serious gentleman's demeanor. Um, he, his, because he drank so much port and Madeira, the hippopotamus bone was stained so dark that it was almost black. Uh, uh, so it would have been very unflattering. Right. Um, <laughs> Fascinating. Yeah, it was, it was animal bone. So I, I want to move on with him a little bit more because some of the stuff on him really does fascinate me. For instance, his salary today would be a million dollars? Something like that. I love this more guy. Like, probably actually a little more than that now. It's around twenty five grand. Um, and that points to a, another uh, interesting point, not only about Washington, but about a lot of the men who held that office, is that um, there's always financial hardship that lurks like a sort of Damocles over so many of these of these men. And it shapes a lot of the decisions they make, including the presidency. Um, during his stint as commander-in-chief during the revolution, of course, he's kept away from his wife. They saw each other so infrequently, it drove both of them nuts. I mean, he really just wanted to get back to his wife, but he also wanted to get back to Mount Vernon, which was his other love. And during the war, Mount Vernon suffered from his absence. And by the end of it, the end of the war, it was in trouble. He was in financial straits. And he had absolutely no love of the idea of going back to serve again. When they, you know, when he, when he, everyone was like, you have to run for president, and he, of course, he he could have been made king. I mean, he could have. He was one of the few. He was the only man, in, the only American in our history who could have accepted the role of king had he wanted it. There would have been enough backup, I think. And, but he doesn't want that. He wants to retire onto his farm. Instead, he goes back. And one of the reasons he takes up the job is because, frankly, he needed it. And he needed that salary. And so this was one way of providing for, for his wife. Uh, and he was genuinely worried about it, about that at the end of the revolution. A lot of money, a lot of money. And he used that money, by the way. He bought leopard skin robes for his horses. I'm a horsewoman from from Virginia. Honey, you know, oh, my God. That's yeah. Extra. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, he was. Um, well, again, his mother had been a, a great equestrian. He was a, an exceptional equestrian, an exceptional dancer, swordsman, etc. He loved horses. He loved the trappings of aristocracy, of gentry, uh, especially the Virginia gentry, which he, uh, you know, in whose ranks he he had always wanted to be. It's how he cultivated himself, and one of the reasons he married uh, Mary Custis, 
um, because without her lands, he, he would have been nothing, frankly. And um, so, yeah, as president, he brings, uh, I mean, again, somebody had to be the first president, and we could have done a lot worse than, than George. But he was, he, had, he was walking a fine line. You know, how much majesty do I bring to the office when we're still a republic? I'm elected. I answer to the people, not the other way around. But there still has to be a kind of a patriarch. Is, is, was his thinking. So let's have the trappings of that. So that meant spending 7% of that 25 grand on booze for entertaining. It was also the 18th century. Everybody drank like a fish. Right. And um, leopard skin robes for his matched horses. He had an exceptional uh, gilded carriage and that sort of thing. And, you know, that was the Federalist approach to the presidency. He and Adams, his successor, did the same thing. And it got them into, the tru- into trouble with the Jeffersonians who looked at all of this as a bunch of uh, a, a smacking of monarchy. I love it. I absolutely love it. And he was not happy with uh, his, his, his the wife that Martha, who we all knew and, you know, to this day, I guess, love was not the love of his life. But I'm going to leave that there. Leave that there for now. I just wanted to throw that out there because one of the great things about this book is there is just so much stuff in it. So everybody's got to pick it up. We're just going to tease you guys now because that's how good this thing is with great trivia. <laughs> no, it's true. I mean, I just was, how, you know, I, I'm going to tell you where the book is. And every time I sit down, I read it. I won't tell you that. That's too crazy. Let's jump ahead a little bit. We'll get, <laughs> you got it. Gerald Ford was a model. This I did not know. Oh, sure. Uh, he he could have been a football player. He, uh, so he had a football player's build. He, uh, a- after college, I played college ball, and he was a natural. And uh, he was already being scouted by professional teams. He could have gone to the to the NFL. Uh, he decided to go to law school instead. It changed everything. And, of course, he went on to become a politician after becoming a lawyer. But he had that football, uh, football player's physique. He was a natural athlete, uh, man of many talents. So yeah, in 1939, uh, he he and his girlfriend did a, a, a pictorial in Look magazine where they were sort of scantily clad bathers and that sort of thing, a, 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 a kind of glance, if you will, at how the beautiful people live. And uh, and then during World War II, I think it was 42, uh, he was the cover model for Cosmopolitan. So yeah, man of many talents. <laughs> I would say, I would say, absolutely. And he was, he was adorable. I mean, he was a good-looking guy. There's no question about that. Okay. Yeah, and he had, he had, he had all his hair back then. Yeah, exactly. When you look at the early... <laughs> his son actually looked exactly like him. J- and Jimmy Carter, besides having lust in his heart, also saw, what? UFOs? Come on. Well, that was before his presidency. Back in 1969, uh, I think he was leave, leaving a Lions Club meeting and, and there in the parking lot in the... In, descending out of the night sky, according to he and his fellow attendees, uh, was this bright light that they could not identify, descending slowly, incredibly bright, uh, um, very difficult to look at. Uh, it, it was, it, you know, there was no noise associated with it. The whole thing was extremely mysterious. They were struck by it, and Carter himself was shaken, was so shaken by it that he wrote a formal report to the, uh, the uh, UFO reporting agency um, the, at, the, at the federal level. There was such a thing back then because they were compiling sightings like this. Um, I think it was the one that was probably associated with the Air Force. I'm not sure. But um, so, yeah, he remains the only president who who's on record as at some point in his life uh, seeing an an unidentified flying object. Unbelievable. We have really had some winners. One of them was Warren G. Harding. Well, that for a lot of different reasons. But what, what he lost a set of priceless White House China in a poker game. That's not true. Or that's really true. Yeah, yeah he's a, he was an inveterate uh, gambler, loved poker. Um, it, it was. There were a lot of. I mean, uh, you know, it was a night, almost a nightly thing at the Warren uh, Harding White House. Uh, his wife would serve the liquor, uh, flouting prohibition, um, and he and his fellow, in the members of his Ohio gang, as they were called, the, the hangers-on that he brought from Ohio, would would play cards and talk and drink. And and one time there was no cash at hand, so we brought out a box of White House china <laughs> and lost it. <laughs> I love that. What was the craziest thing that you think that you dug up? Um, oh gosh, there's so many. The the I think that the craziest thing because it, it it's it's crazy on a number of different levels and it's frankly alarming. And it also segues with the big picture of history is that um is Jack Kennedy of course uh had uh, terrible health problems. By the time he was president, and talk about secrets, very few people knew this. I mean, it was understood that he had, had operations. It was understood that he didn't have the best back in the world. But it was it was understood by very few Americans just how excruciating the pain was that Kennedy was living through 
day in, day out, hourly. And um, not long into his presidency, he, of course, has this ex- extremely important meeting with Khrushchev in Vienna. I mean, this is a meeting of, of, of uh, the, two mo- the two superpowers. It's also Jack Kennedy's first outing with uh, the U.S.'s primary um, adversary. And so they're scouting each other out. And, and Khrushchev, during these meetings, you know, he's been informed that Jack Kennedy is he's a new breed. I mean, he's, he's the first president born, you know, uh, uh, he's, he's the youngest one in a long time. He's born uh, after the, the advent of the 20th century. He's, um, I mean, he's, he's young and virile. He's good looking. The country loves him. And there in Vienna, he's seeing a very different Kennedy because Kennedy was so doped up. On these uh, concoctions given to him by uh, so-called Dr. Feelgood, the, the celebrity doctor, who made a lot of celebrities feel good uh, with with all kinds of you know, if they sometimes it was just drugs to get high, but sometimes it was to deal with pain. All of these things were terrible narcotics; they were illegal. The concoctions were ghastly, and um, yeah, I mean opioids. And uh, so Kennedy. Uh, he was taking these drugs, uh, shooting himself up regularly in Vienna like crazy because uh, he was, you know, this is the only way he's going to get by, and he has to, he has to look to the world like something more than somebody who's wincing all the time or, or not getting out of bed. And there, Khrushchev sees this this guy who's clearly not, he's he's off in some way, he's he's tired or he's listless, uh, he's got a waxen complexion, and it's there that Khrushchev decides he can dominate this guy. And, it, and it's it's not long after that that we have the Cuban Missile Crisis. It leads ultimately to that that kind of showdown. That's a fascinating story. Absolutely fascinating. I mean, I knew about the drugs and stuff, but or I uh, about the bad back and the Addison disease. But when you put it the way you put it, fantastic. And that's why this book is so darn important. I, I'm going to jump to Trump very quickly, and I don't have a lot of time, but I did want to pow right in the kisser. What? <laughs> oh yeah, when he was uh, gosh, was that second grade? I think he he, he struck a teacher. Um, you know, the, the, he had a rambunctious youth. He was acting out. Uh, I don't know if I would have wanted, wanted to be uh, in that in that family at that time. It was, you know, it, it, I think he he was he was he couldn't he was having trouble finding himself, and, and, and consequently became this uh, this occasional bully, uh, a, an unpleasant guy. He was constantly um, roughhousing. Uh, he was disruptive in class on a routine basis, and it's this kind of behavior that. That got him sent by his father to military school, um, which at least more or less straightened him out. More or less. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to put that in. Well, yeah. Out of all the research you did, the one thing that you, you felt was the most important thing that you uncovered would really would be game-changing in terms of how we see our presidents. Was there one thing that just went, oh, my gosh, this, this is really something? Not really. No. So, uh, I think that the Kennedy story, when I put it all together, uh, I thought was was remarkable, uh, and that so much relied. Well, there's also, uh, you know, frankly, there. This this is a, the newest edition of a book that's gone through three iterations. Right. Uh, and and in in the Nixon chapter, we included because of recently declassified tapes, we included the story about um, the 1968 presidential campaign. And now we know that uh, Nixon deliberately undermined Johnson's attempt to make peace between the South and North Vietnamese, because if Johnson pulled that off in 68, it would have given the Democrats the White House for another four years. Nixon knew that. Johnson knew that, which is why he was striving so, so hard for it. So Nixon finds out about this, and he's got to he's got to derail the Democratic process somehow. So as a presidential candidate, a Republican candidate. He sends Anna Chenault, a, a, an unofficial emissary, to Southeast Asia to convince the, the South Vietnamese to hold back and hold hold off making formal peace until after Dick Nixon is elected, at which time in 1969 you'll be given an even better deal than Johnson's offering you. And this was all under the table. Johnson knew about it and was incensed, to say the least, because this was tantamount to treason. But neither side uh, – well, he didn't expose Nixon because – the only reason he knew was because he he'd been bugging Nixon, uh, which was illegal at the time. It was all wiretaps on Nixon's campaign. So both of them let the issue die quietly. Nixon became president in 69, but of course uh, the war keeps going. His plan uh, derailed and uh, to end it in 69, and it, it, was, it wouldn't end until many years later, uh, or several years later at least. Uh, 
but and we we only know that for sure now because of, of some of the Johnson tapes that have been only recently declassified. Yeah, that's fascinating. It's a chilling, it's a chilling story, really. I bet you there are a lot of those chilling stories, and some of them even happening now. I only have like uh, forty five seconds, but I have to ask you this: sane or insane? Do you think, after all you learned about these guys, that they and guys, to bet it's not girls yet, but guys, uh, that they have to be a little nuts to take on the enormity of the job of president? Well, it's a it's a great question, and. And I'm certainly not the only one who's wondered it, and you're not either. We've all wondered it, haven't we? Uh, I, I've given that a lot of thought, because I certainly don't want to be president of the United States. It's, it's nothing so crazy would ever occur to me. Um, and I don't know if it's nuts, because admittedly that's a subjective word, but something along the lines of um, if your ambition is such that it, it borders on masochism, in order to want to do this, you've got to have a level of ambition that verges – on on masochism, on, on, on almost self-destructive, because you will be um, you will be you will be on the ropes, and it will seem like an eternity. I've been speaking with Cormac O'Brien, author of Secret Lives of the U.S. Presidents: Strange Stories and Shocking Trivia from Inside the White House. For more information about the book, visit Amazon.com. You are listening to The Hallie Kesser Jane Show. My guests today are Cormac O'Brien, author of Secret Lives of the U.S. Presidents, Strange Stories and Shocking Trivia from Inside the White House, and Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist and author Glenn Frankel, author of High Noon, The Hollywood Blacklist, and the Making of an American Classic. Tune in to The Hallie Kesser Jane Show at HallieKesserJane.com. Glenn Frankel is a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist, university professor, and author of the best-selling New York Times and Los Angeles Times book, The Searchers, The Making of an American Legend. He was director of the School of Journalism at the University of Texas at Austin and a visiting professor at Stanford University. The longtime Washington Post reporter, editor, and bureau chief in London, South Africa, and Jerusalem, Frankel won the 1989 Pulitzer Prize for international reporting. He also served as editor of the Washington Post magazine. Now Frankel tackles a new subject. In his book, High Noon, Frankel explores the making of High Noon, the Western classic starring Gary Cooper and Grace Kelly, made during the toxic political climate of the late 1940s and 1950s Hollywood Red Scare. The film, written by Carl Foreman, a former communist who intended the film to be a parable about the Hollywood blacklist. In fact, during filming, Foreman was forced to testify before the House Committee on Un-American Activities about his former membership in the Communist Party. Weaving together the stories of some of Hollywood's most talented writers and producers, Carl Foreman, Stanley Kramer, Fred Zinneman, and Cooper himself, High Noon is at once Hollywood history, scholarly insight, and wonderfully dishy, in a word, fascinating. Let's talk. Wow, this is a great book, Glenn. I got to give it to you. But you know, this is so funny. Where do you come up with these things? This one's really unusual. I, I love High Noon. I love the concept. What got you going on it? Well, actually, it just sort of fell into my lap. Uh, you know, I had done a previous book about the John Ford film, The Searchers, with John Wayne and um, and its connection to Texas history. And um, I was at the University of Texas at the time, and uh, I just uh, a bunch of buddies in the faculty and myself decided we'd do a little sort of Western film festival. And I did The Searchers, introduced it, and talked about it. And then a professor in the radio, TV, and film department, a guy who really knows a lot about movies, did High Noon. And he not only did the, the movie itself, but he talked about the blacklist and the political implications of it. And, you know, I'd vaguely known there was a political uh, importance, significance to High Noon, but I really didn't know the story. But by the time he got done, I was I was totally hooked. And I looked around a little to see if anybody had really done this before. And the answer was no. So, you know, within a week, I decided it was perfect. It, it's like it seems like I'm in my own little subgenre now of, of sort of iconic movies that occur at important, turbulent, you know, difficult moments in American history. And so that it, it just fit perfectly. And, and it was such an interesting project because it's so relevant in so many different ways. Oh, boy, oh, boy. We're in today. <laughs> you got yeah. it. We're going to talk about that in a minute, too. Let me take you here. I mean, the, this is funny because the two things, film and the House on American Activities Committee, I, I'm possessed. 
like you apparently became and are. So, I mean, let's just talk about that. Um, but before sure. we, we get into all of that, I, I do have to do one thing. I was amazed at the research you did on this project and so much that you uncovered. And so I want people to understand before we even go in, there's so much new material in this. Let's let's talk about that briefly. Well, I was very lucky. I live in Arlington, Virginia, just outside of D.C., and so I had uh, I was a metro ride away from the National Archives. Uh, which is a font of great information about the House on American Activities Committee. Hallie, in the early uh, 2000s, a lot of material that had been um, in executive session stuff, uh, confidential files that had never been released, uh, the 50-year limited test, and a lot of that stuff got into the public record, and you could go look at it. And the great Hollywood blacklist books were written in the 80s and uh, before that, and so a lot of this material was out there, but hadn't been done before. Their executive sessions with certain witnesses, including one with my protagonist, Carl Foreman, the screenwriter who wrote High Noon, and who was blacklisted right around that time. Also with some of the other witnesses. So that was a great source of information for me. And then, you know, out in L.A., the, the Margaret Herrick Library, which is run by the Motion Picture Academy, and the U- University of Southern California Library. If you dig long and hard enough in those places, you can find some interviews on tape that have never been transcribed with some of the folks who made High Noon, Stanley Kramer, the producer, uh, Carl Foreman, the screenwriter, uh, and a few others. And those were incredibly useful as well. Lucky So I was you. really lucky. Yep, I was going to say, a lucky, lucky, lucky guy. I'm going to assume that everybody does not know about what went on. So could you just give a real short, brief history of what did go on with the House on American Activities and the Blacklist so that people who don't know might understand what, where we're going to go with this conversation. Yes, of course. Um, it really just starts acting up after World War II. Um, the House on American Activities Committee was formed around that time to look into uh, fascist uh, political movements and also in the communist ones. But they pretty quickly centered on the communist one because, you know, after the war, our little detente with the Soviet Union to defeat Nazi Germany was over. The Cold War gets started up, and uh, Russia is now our enemy and not our ally. And so, and around the same time, a lot of forces um, on the right, the political right, who had been kind of lying low during the New Deal and during World War II, well, they came back with a vengeance. And um, then the hunt was on for subversives, people in the government who were undermining our country, and not just in the government, in the schools, in the libraries, and in the movies. There was a sense that these outsiders, and in those days it was communists or liberals or Jews, for that matter, uh, sometimes all three. These days, I guess you could say it's you know Muslim extremists and uh, undocumented uh, immigrants and refugees who are the target. But these outsiders somehow were stealing our culture. They were usurping, you know, our Americanism. And a a backlash movement, a right-wing movement for the most part, was fighting to get it back. So the House on American Activities Committee comes to Hollywood, among many other places that they go to, to hold hearings into alleged communist infiltration of the movie business. And they get friendly witnesses, uh, some uh, actors and directors on the right, and they get, and then they uh, go after unfriendly witnesses, as they call them, people who had been members of the American Communist Party or who had worked closely with it at a certain point. And they hold hearings, and they kind of act as, you know, judge, jury, and executioner. These people aren't charged with crimes. They're charged with not cooperating with the committee with contempt of Congress. So they come first in 1947 and hold a series of hearings, and eventually 10 people are charged with contempt of Congress. They become what's known as the Hollywood Ten. Four years later, after these guys have been sentenced to prison, the committee comes back for a sequel. And this time, they get a lot more witnesses, some actors and performers, directors, screenwriters. And they're basically asking them, you know, to fess up to their communist connections in the past, to denounce communism, to praise the committee, because that's part of it, praising the committee for its courage and the good work it's doing to root out this evil, and then to top it off, they want you to name names of yeah. people who you were in the party with or other people who are subversives. That's the ultimate test of whether you're honest and, you know, you're uh, being apologetic for what you did and, and ready for redemption. So this ritual of public humiliation, this inquisition, gets carried on by this committee, and it goes on and off for several years. And 
hundreds of people are blacklisted as a result. People can't find work, or people who had work in Hollywood are fired and never hired again and never really told why. And so that's the background. That's what's going on. That's the politics. It has some, you know, analogies to modern day politics. Oh, yeah, I would say so. Absolutely. And I think that's what really makes this very, very special timeliness of it. Couldn't it be better? The rhetoric was incredibly toxic and vicious. It was very personal. As I say, this was judge, jury, and executioner. It wasn't like, you, you know, you got due process before you lost your job. You had to prove that you hadn't done these things, and that was really difficult to do. So, and it's a backlash movement, a little similar to what the Tea Party was like a few years ago. These people have taken our country away, and we need to get it back. That was the attitude. And so there's a lot of echoes back and forth and a lot we can learn. So let's take this to Carl Foreman, who was a nice Jewish boy from Chicago who in his youth toyed with communism who doesn't when you're you know come from a jewish liberal family i mean (laughs) at some point or another and carl was this young writer and i want to just say this i think the point that you did did make maybe in that last little um, thing that you just gave us is what it demanded of you if you did get called you either were gonna rat on your best friend or Mm -hmm. you were you were gonna sell your soul what there was no there was nothing to win here But talk about Carl. That was the dilemma. That was the dilemma he faced. You're right. He was a nice Jewish boy from Chicago. He joined the party with his wife in the late 1930s at a time of the Great Depression. And, you know, um, out of idealism, I would say that the communists were fighting racism. They were fighting fascism. He eventually lost interest in the Communist Party and fell out with them over a number of issues. They didn't turn out to be quite the idealists that he had hoped. In the late 1940s, when the committee holds its first hearings, Carl's just a little nebbish of a writer. He hasn't had any big hits or anything. He's working for a small independent film company, but he's doing some good work. And over the next few years, he's nominated three times for Best uh, Screenplay for Academy Awards. And so by 1951, when the committee comes back to Hollywood, Carl is a big deal. And they they find out that he was connected with the Communist Party through another screenwriter who names him. And then they go after him, and he gets his subpoena right around the time he's working on finishing the screenplay for High Noon. And he faces a terrible choice here. Um, he's either got to go along with that ritual I described earlier of, you know, self-confession and then naming names of other people to prove your bona fides, let's say, or losing his job. He either goes along with the committee and cooperates, or he knows he's going to be blacklisted. And, you know, this is no easy choice with a career that's just taking off. He's just making money. He's just having a good time here. But he faces a terrible dilemma as to what to do. And my book is about how he dealt with that and and how anyone deals with that, because he wasn't the only one who faced it. But I found Carl really a fascinating figure, because he's not trying to be a martyr here or a hero. He's no communist, certainly at this point, and, you know, and doesn't feel he owes them anything. But at the same time, ratting out other people and humiliating yourself in public in that way is something that he just can't do. And so he faces a terrible choice to make. And here is, here is where I think this book is so extraordinarily special. And that is, you get into the heart of this guy, and remember he's the screenwriter, so he's working on this unreal what will become one of the iconic westerns ever high noon which you point out now becomes for him an allegory for what's happening to him yeah that's exactly right i mean he's about to halfway even two-thirds of the way finished when he gets a subpoena in the summer of 1951 calling him to testify in september which is incidentally is when the film shoot right in the middle of the film shoot and so you know he's finishing up the script He's already got, uh, you know, he's writing about a lawman who's facing four people, four armed gunmen, led by a man who he had put in prison many years earlier, and they're coming back to town. The guy has gotten out of prison, he's gotten pardoned early, and they're coming back to town to kill the lawman. And the heart of High Noon, or the moral heart of High Noon, is the efforts of this guy. His name is Will Kane in the movie, and he's played, of course, by the great Western star Gary Cooper. Is Will Kane going around the little town of Hadleyville, sounds a lot like Hollywood, looking for support among the community, going to his friends, going to the town counselors, going to the church, it's a Sunday morning, and talking to the congregants and the minister, looking for people 
who will stand beside him and stand up to these four bad guys when they finally uh, come to town. And finding to his great surprise, uh, stunning surprise, that nobody's going to be out there with him that day. For all kinds of reasons, they've got all kinds of excuses to make, but essentially they are not willing to stand up for decency um, and morality, and they're going to leave this lawman. They suggest to him that he get out of town quickly, but they're going to leave him the twist and the wind and to face these four gunmen by himself. And for Carl, he says, as he was finishing the screenplay, he himself became the lawman. He was Will Kane. He found that friends of his in Hollywood were sort of crossing the street to avoid talking to him, that the people who were his business partners in this small, very interesting little independent film company that was headed by the great Stanley Kramer, who was a close friend of his, he found that these guys were beginning to shun him. They were worried about what he was going to say. Uh, the Kramer company was especially worried because they just signed a new film deal with Columbia that was going to be very... You know, they were going to make a lot of money off it, and they were afraid that if Carl went up there and refused to cooperate, that it would kill the deal and that it would damage the company. So Carl's hearing all this, and he's getting angrier and more concerned, and he writes some of this into the movie, and the movie becomes a blacklist parable for him. He doesn't tell a lot of people he's doing this, because that would be the kiss of death. The, the movie would never get made. Hollywood was really nervous at this point about the House on American Activities Committee, and nobody was in the mood to really take them on. Uh, so he does this very quietly, but nonetheless, there it is. You see it in the film, you can get the sense of it, and some people smelled it out at the time. Um, it's, it is utterly fascinating when you go back, which I did last night, to watch it after reading your book. <laughs> I have to tell you, it gives it a whole new world, of enough, a whole new flavor. I'm going to go here with you. I happened to have met Stanley and spent some time with Stanley Kramer at the end of his career. Very, very interesting man. Eye rolling when you're with him, when I was with him. But I want to talk to you about him and Zinnemann. The Jewish thing also. I, I want to, I want, I'm Jewish, I'm fascinated. <laughs> you are ah, too. the Jewish thing. <laughs> <laughs> well... Yeah, but talk to me about all of that because I, I do think that that's, that's interesting. And I'm not so sure that that's uh, not coming, that it's not coming back. Uh, this Jewish mm -hmm. thing. Well, that's a really good question. But, you know, and ho first of all, Hollywood was kind of founded by the Jews, by Jewish immigrants, by the sons of Jewish immigrants. They led just about every one of the major companies um, outside of 20th Century Fox. And, um, you know, and Hollywood was a fairly progressive place politically. People like Stanley Kramer uh, and Carl Foreman and Fred Zimmerman, and all of them political liberals, um, all of them either the sons of immigrants or immigrants themselves. Fred actually came from Vienna. Fred was the director of High Dune. He's the last guy added to this crew. Very talented group, very progressive, as they say, making movies with social relevance. They made several movies. They made Champion about a boxer with Kirk Douglas. They made The Men, Marlon Brando's first movie about paraplegics, uh, war veterans, and the, the problems they faced. I mean, so these are politically engaged people making really interesting films. And then the, the Blacklist and the Red Scare and the House on American Activities Committee comes along. And so they all face a crisis of sorts. Fred Zinnemann continued to back Carl Foreman throughout this crisis um, and, you know, and never backed down. For Stanley Kramer, you know, it was a more complex calculation because I think his sympathies were with, with Carl. They'd been close friends and good collaborators for several years. And yet Stanley was very much afraid um, that, as I say, Carl's testimony that if he refused to cooperate, that that would hurt the company and maybe get him blacklisted. He'd been named a few times by informants. Because remember, in those days, if you were a liberal, you were also suspect. They were looking at liberals. They were looking at Jews. They were looking at ex-communists. And all those people were being treated as outsiders, as the other, as people to fear, as people to be sought out as subversives. So, you know, this was, this was something every one of those folks had to deal with. Stanley, to his credit, Later, after this is all over, and he's and he's an independent director and producer, makes a number of socially very uh, important movies and hires people who are on the blacklist right. uh, to write some of them. Yeah, so he I think, plays yeah. a role 
in the late 50s and early 60s in breaking the blacklist and, and, and killing it, and a very public role. He even debated the head of the American Legion on national television over this. And so, you know, but in this instance with Carl, uh, I won't get into the details, but the two men were not exactly, you know, there was a falling out. And they didn't really trust each other. And so Stanley didn't believe some of what Carl was telling him. And Carl felt betrayed by Stanley. But, Hallie, that gets to another important point of this. It's not just, you know, right wing versus left wing. And, you know, the committee is clearly the enemy to these guys. The real the real betrayals and feelings of, you know, uh, hard feelings around the blacklist is often within your own group. It's with It broke up families. It damaged careers. It ended business associations. You know, the real sense of betrayal, if you name names, you were naming your best friends and people you knew. And in one or two cases, people named their girlfriends or their wives or, you know, or were asked about these kinds of things. So it's a very intimate kind of damage that is done yeah. in the community. I think that's important. And that's really... Yeah. That's that. That's it, it, critical to to na- to say that, and I'm glad that you put it in that um, perspective. I'm, I have to move on, but because we're running out of time, but I got so much to talk to you about Gary Cooper. I have to say this to you: the ultimate goy. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you could you couldn't do any better. It becomes the star of the film and actually, you know, sticks up for uh, Carl in his way. But but talk a little bit about Gary Cooper. Oh god, Gary Cooper. Well, Cooper is just the opposite of these three, though he himself his parents were British immigrants, which I found out which was really fascinating. They both moved to Montana and they met each other there. They came from England. So he himself was the son of immigrants, but you're right, very waspy, a real cowboy. He was the real thing. He gives High Noon, I think, an authenticity as a Western that it otherwise would not have had. And he was a right-wing Republican for the most part and an anti-communist, joined the Motion Picture Alliance, which was a group with John Wayne and Hedda Hopper and others who were very strongly anti-communist. But at the same time, he loved the script for High Noon. He agreed to do the movie for less than half the price he normally charged because he wanted to be in a good movie and he got to know Carl uh, Foreman while working on the movie and he liked him and this guy was very intuitive he wasn't terribly ideological he liked Carl he trusted him and when Carl told him he was being subpoenaed and that he'd have to testify Cooper said he would support him and he did he tried hard to support him he finished making the movie for one thing he invested or said he would invest in the little production company that Carl tried to start after he was blacklisted Eventually, Cooper pulls out, or quite quickly, Cooper pulls out of this because he's under such pressure from his fellow anti-communists like Hedda Hopper, the columnist, and John Wayne, of all people, that Cooper has to back down. But he genuinely liked and respected Carl and wanted to help him. The left-wing press, the uh, how are they? Because I think the press is, you, you brought up Hedda Hopper, the right, but on the left wing, they, they again, there's a similarity to where we are today. <laughs> Want to talk to me? Well... You know, it's the I'm an old Washington Post reporter, I know, so I, I was know. looking at you know the mainstream press of the Washington Post and the New York Times and the Herald Tribune. One thing struck me: there were some very courageous people and some good editorials and all that, pointing out the the problems with the Inquisition. But at the same time, the daily reporting accepted the terms of engagement, if you will, that the committee set up. You know, if you report on things that are happening in an official uh, uh, hearing session. You uh, you can print them without worrying about libel. You know, they're privileged information. And I found that all of these newspapers printed the stuff, the allegations that so-and-so was a communist, without ever really checking, without even contacting the person who'd been named to ask them, well, what's your response to this? You know, hundreds of names were sort of sent out there, and they appear in these newspapers with no critique. So, you know, it was kind of like the the, the press is supposed to be the watchdogs and the guardian of truth and accountability of government and government committees. But in this case, I think the mainstream press really let us down. And uh, there were many institutions that failed around the time of the blacklist, that failed to do their jobs, but one of them very much was the mainstream media. I want to uh, bring in Dalton Trumbo. Uh, I think it's important, as we, we wrap this thing up, another screenwriter who's blacklisted, let's talk Kirk Douglas, Stanley Kramer, obviously, and Otto Preminger ultimately undermined and destroyed the, the blacklist. I would say, I'm not sure, you know, you can, you, you, you take it from there, but, but in a way there was, if you can, make a happy ending out of a, a, a something like this. Well, Trumbo was a very talented screenwriter. He was one of the Hollywood 10, the guys who were convicted of contempt of Congress and went to jail for a year. 
He works under pseudonyms. He writes endless screenplays. He's taken, you know, a big cut in pay. There was a good movie about him two years ago that goes into this in quite interesting ways. But you're right. At the end of the day, he's so talented, these guys want to use him. And Kirk Douglas hires him to write the screenplay for Spartacus. And Otto Preminger hires him to write the screenplay for Exodus. And both these guys, they're almost in a competition. They both decide they're going to put Trumbo's real name next to the screenplay. And um, and they face a lot of opposition to that, but they're independent enough that they can get away with it. Um, President Kennedy plays a role here because he actually goes and watches Spartacus a few weeks after he gets in the White House, and he comes out of it. And, and President Kennedy, even having gone there, sort of suggests that he's not, you know, he's not going to follow the blacklist. That really is the death knell for it. So yes, Trumbo emerges. Other writers emerge slowly but surely to get the credit that they deserved. But, there, you know, I don't know if it's a happy ending, Hallie, because so much damage was done. People lost money. People lost their lives. People whose health wasn't in great shape to begin with. The, uh, John Garfield dies at 39, the great actor uh, from, heart, uh, you know, from a heart condition. He's been blacklisted. Other people. This was a lot of damage was done. And the amazing thing is the blacklisted lasted 10 years and even longer for a lot of people. It's not a happy moment in American history. It's quite an ugly affair. Well, I, I'll give you that. That's why I put it when I said it, when I said it, a happy ending. The only, <laughs> the only reason I, some people did finally have the gumption to stand up and, and, and to do what needed to be done in their own way. And I think that that says something. And I just didn't want to let that go completely. Listen, at the end of the day, high noon, box office critical success, wins four Academy Awards, including Best uh, Actor for Cooper. What happened to Foreman? Well, Foreman ended up moving to London after his hopes of starting something, getting something going in, in Hollywood gave out. And he writes a number of screenplays under a pseudonym as well. Eventually, he manages to clear himself, again, in an executive session, and I've seen the transcript, um, where he doesn't give much ground, but he does denounce the Communist Party, but he doesn't name names, and he doesn't praise the committee very much either. Uh, nonetheless, you know, he was in such demand that Columbia Pictures hired him back. Uh, he did a number of great screenplays and got a few more Academy Award nominations. But ironically, the one time he actually won, he and another blacklisted writer named Michael Wilson wrote the screenplay for The Bridge on the River Kwai. The only problem is they didn't get the credit at the time. It was given to someone else. And it's only 25 years later or so that the Motion Picture Academy, after investigating, gives them their Academy Awards. But by then, both men are dead. It's their widows who go and pick up the prizes. So... You know, this was the ultimate sad aspect of it. Carl did a lot of great work after that, you know, after uh, he moved to London. But he always felt that there had been extraordinary damage to his life and to his career and to the work he loved to do. And, you know, he paid a big price for being an honest man. In the context of where we are today, you, Mr. Writer about politics, you go to the hottest regions in the world in your day. God bless you, Palestine, you know, Israel. West Bank, you've been through it all, written one great book about it. Uh, where haven't you been? South Africa, too, right? I mean, I remember following yeah, you all the I mean, yeah, yeah, you know, you've been in the hot spots, buddy, and you haven't been afraid to write it and write, write it well. I see this as a cautionary tale, your book. Talk to me. I think that's true. I think one of the things that surprises, surprised me about that era, and you could say it about our era now, we have this wonderful democracy that's 230 years old or older, and... Um, but it's fragile. Uh, it can be hijacked. Bad things can happen. You can't let your guard down. And, and when we have a situation where, you know, as it was in those days, both houses of Congress uh, were in one party hands. And today we have the presidency in the hands of a man who uh, doesn't really recognize the usual boundaries of constitutional authority and that sort of thing. You know, it requires the sort of non-governmental institutions and especially the press to be extra vigilant. We've got to hold people in power accountable for their actions. I actually think, you know, with every crisis, there's an opportunity. Well, there's an opportunity here now for the press to do its job. And I think we're seeing that. The mainstream press, the New York Times and the Washington Post and NPR and CNN are really getting out there and giving us a lot of news that we need to have. I'm not uh, sure how this is all going to turn out, but I think the lesson of the blacklist is that you've got to be, as I say, constantly vigilant. Democracy ain't easy. And if we're not careful, it's very easy to demonize a group of people, whether they're, you know, immigrants, whether they're Muslims, you know, to turn the country against them. 
And that's why it's so important that people like journalists do their job and do it well and do the kind of reporting that tells you what's true and what's fantasy. I've been speaking with Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist and author Glenn Frankel. His book, High Noon, The Hollywood Blacklist and the Making of an American Classic. For more information about Glenn Frankel and his work, visit glennfrankel.com. Thanks so much for tuning in to The Hallie Kessler Jane Show, a production of Resec LLC. The Hallie Kessler Jane Show posts new podcasts Wednesdays, 3 p.m. Eastern. Visit HallieKesserJane.com. Thank you.